Ladies and gentlemen, it's not often we we all talk about space and space ex exploration, but an adjective like celestial is much more poetic than that. So few space explorers use this one, especially in naming their company, business or institution. Here to talk to you, we have Mai Yang representing Celestial Space Technologies. And the title is Celestial in New Space Economy. Mai Yang, our virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, hi, um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Mayank and uh, I'm one of the founders of Celestial. Um, I'm here to represent what our company does. So at Celestial, uh, we have a mission. That we, d we want to redefine antennas to do much more than just communications. And uh, you will get to know how. So uh, right now we are dealing with the problem related to small satellites. Small satellites, because of their uh, architecture, they're very small. And uh, this gives rise to few problems, few challenges when they are developed because of uh, smaller size, they have uh, smaller power budgets, they have uh, smaller volume, which results into smaller uh, lifetime of these satellites and also uh, lower link margins for communications. As a result, what we see now right now is uh, already a lost assets of 150 million euros uh, in the orbit. We have a solution for that, and uh, we think uh, reconfigurable systems, which can give satellite primary mission and then can be reusing the satellite for secondary mission could be an option. Uh, we think uh, high power antennas could be a solution which would uh, lead these satellites into deep space missions or also higher orbit missions. And then we think there should be uh, systems which are high, uh, highly integrated systems, which can offer more than one functionality, then we can have better and optimized uh, volume occupancy in the satellites. Uh, shown below uh, in the slide is uh, two of our products in the market, S and X band patch antenna. Uh, I will cover them in detail in the next slide. And uh, we are doing an SDR based uh, communication system and we are uh, developing this right now in our company. Uh, our products, the value proposition that we are offering is uh, that our products, uh, they are highly customizable. They offer uh, better power uh, budgets, they offer higher link margins, they extend mission lifetime and they are extending basically the uh, overall performance of the uh, satellite missions. <coughs> uh, this is uh, one uh, competition analysis of our S-band patch antenna. Um, the blue circle is uh, Celestial's antenna that we designed and uh, the gray circles are other uh, similar antennas available in the market. Uh, you can see uh, the size of the uh, circle is basically the cost of antenna. And uh, it is clear from this, uh, from this uh, comparison that uh, our antenna is on the lower side in the market uh, as, as far as cost is concerned and uh, we are able to offer three times the performance as that of other competitive antennas. Uh, this is because when we are designing these antennas, our antennas uh, have uh, employed uh, multiple performance enhancement techniques which gives them the edge. As a result, our antennas are uh, very thin, they occupy minimum volume, they are able to give very high performance which is three times and uh, they are on the lower side in the cost uh, in the market analysis. So um, our antennas have some kind of competitive advantage in their size, cost, performance, and uh, also development time. Uh, in business model, we uh, identify ourselves as high upstream uh, providers. We are component and systems provider and subsystems provider to the satellite, uh, satellite developers. Uh, we have a product delivery cycle of uh, seven steps in which uh, Celestial works mainly on second and third uh, second and third step where we are doing antenna designs and um, material selection. We identify ourselves not antenna suppliers but antenna designers. We design so efficient antennas that they are three times better than what, what others are offering in the market. Uh, we have uh, then the manufacturing, production and testing of these antennas is outsourced from our site, so we don't do this in-house. And uh, we work with our customers on uh, defining the requirements of the end product and integrating our products to the satellite. Uh, based on the market analysis, there are roughly 10,000 satellites which are um, planned to be launched, uh, out of which 32% of uh, these satellites would work on S and X band frequencies the frequencies that our products uh, focus on. And uh, every other satellite, since there are mega constellations and constellations being uh, launched, so these satellites would have more than one antenna. So we see ourselves uh, in a highly scalable market uh, where uh, we are also having competitive advantages now. Uh, current R&D for us is now um, a very disruptive antenna technology where we are designing uh, transparent antennas integrated with solar panels. 
uh, we think uh, this this kind of technology should have come already before years but has not been uh, there in the market yet and now we have finalized few designs on this antenna uh, by the end of this year we will test our prototypes and uh, we will also look for in orbit demonstration of these antennas uh, once our technology is uh, very very validated which is on on the materials uh, on the manufacturing technology and on uh, integration of multiple systems we would also scale this up on deployable solar panel antennas and this would uh, basically we believe disrupt how uh, satellites are communicating right now where they have multiple antennas which are occupying multiple much more volume and uh, more or less different sides of the same satellite uh, we would uh, free all of this for uh, mission specific payloads and cameras and uh, i think uh, this is something that will uh, turn or uh, disrupt communications in uh, in satellite uh, as we see it now uh, why are we doing this? Uh, we are mainly doing this because the trend in the market right now is going in small satellites and mega constellations and uh, there are satellites they are not just now communicating to ground stations as it has been but now they are also uh, need to communicate into satellite links, maybe satellite to deep space links. So uh, satellites will not just communicate in one direction, they will communicate in multiple directions. As a result, uh, these satellites will have a need for multiple antennas on multiple sites. Now we, uh, and because satellites are already small, they are already suffering from uh, low power budgets. We want to supply a solution that uh, gives chance to the satellite developers where they can have links which is three times on different side on different frequencies but yet do not compromise on power budgets of these small satellites. Um, this is one reason and we have validated our technology. Uh, we have discussed this technology with our potential customers and we have already three LOIs on this. Um, we have validated that power generation by our antennas would be helpful. Volume optimization is helpful. Uh, there are some concerns on integration of such antennas because they, they have multiple integration requirements, electrical, RF, and mechanical. But that is an engineering challenge, and I think uh, we can answer engineering challenges very easily. Um, again, the application use case would be for such antennas would be in satellite communication, in deep space communication, drone applications, and um, antennas are general. They are applied in multiple uh, across fields, multiple industries. Uh, the customer benefits that we would mainly offer would be on high volume availability for mission-specific payloads. Uh, better link margins for uh, higher orbit missions for, uh, with small satellites, not just LEO missions, and uh, long communication range uh, with uh, more uh, solar panels on board would extend mission lifetime as well. Uh, we have a policy or we have a campaign for uh, global expansion, and uh, right now we are uh, having a good presence in Europe. Um, I will also cover this part in later slides, and uh, we have also some presence in US and uh, some in India right now. Uh, we believe that our major market would come from US and Asia and this is uh, one of the biggest targets that we will cover in next uh, years to come. And uh, we are also exploring in parallel other uh, markets uh, such as uh, South America, Australia and uh, Africa. So there, there is uh, something or the other happening uh, throughout the world as, uh, as I speak now um, in, in, K in field of space uh, technologies and satellite manufacturing. Uh, some, uh, somewhere or other satellites are being developed uh, across the world and we are keeping our eye on different opportunities in, across different uh, global uh, continents. Currently we are targeting a uh, satellite antenna market. Uh, this is a 30 billion euro market and uh, based on our capabilities, S and X band frequencies and uh, space focused antennas, uh, we have identified ourselves to be an op have obtainable market of 80 million euros with 1.1% growth rate. Um, but uh, once we are established in this market, we will expand ourselves into secondary market, which is drone market, which is other uh, additional um, addressable market of 80 million euros uh, with 6.6% growth rate. So this collectively would be uh, our targeted market in the next five years. Uh, based on this market growth rate and uh, the market forecast, we see ourselves uh, selling at least 600 systems on the minimum um, uh, antenna systems and then 500 systems based on the licensing models where we will reach out to the uh, local uh, sales uh, companies and uh, license our technology. Um, there are multiple revenue streams on the right hand side is a graph based on which there are multiple products that we are working on have been represented in revenue stream wise and major chunk comes from solar antennas and deployable solar panel antennas. Uh, something that we are uh, right now developing and we will test in the next, uh, next uh, months to come. Uh, we have multiple revenue streams in in in, a, in, in our um, in our uh, business model, uh, which more majorly comes from hardware sales, but also selling uh, engineering workshops. We have been uh, associated with academics and uh, uh, students in this regard, 
uh, there is uh, an extra revenues that we can generate on engineering services, uh, environmental testing, and uh, technology licensing side, uh, which is represented on the lower graph, which comes on the top of that blue uh, bar graph, which you see in the lower graph, uh, is, um, is other additional uh, extra revenue streams that we have. Uh, based on all these revenue streams and uh, sales channels that we have, uh, we estimate ourselves to have a revenue, collective revenue of approximately 30 million euros in next five years, um, based on our all these uh, channels. Uh, this is some of the impressions of uh, us working and uh, our uh, collaborations with our partners and uh, our team. Um, on the right, uh, left upper side is me and my co-founder, Johannes. Uh, we are collectively working on this uh, for for a couple of years now, more than a couple of years now. And on the right upper side is our first uh, satellite integrated antenna. Uh, we are doing our in-orbit demonstration in December this year. Uh, we have a few couple of international awards in our pockets. And uh, we are an Isabic alumni. Um, we are... Uh, uh, having our headquarters in Nuremberg, Germany, and we have a, a subsidiary in Luxembourg. Uh, overall, uh, uh, we are an ICT-focused uh, company with uh, deep sp uh, space tech-focused uh, products. Currently, we are asking for some collaborations. We are looking in antenna distribution partners. We want to increase our sales uh, of the uh, highly competitive antennas, uh, high-performance antennas that we have. So we want to look for our uh, partners who can help us in catalog listing and additional markets that um, we might not be able to target at this time because of limited resources. And then we are also looking for private investment to fund our R&D activities, um, which is starting from minimum 200K to 900K euros. Uh, we are looking for in the, uh, investors which are industry proficient, not just money, uh, who can help us uh, crack through markets, uh, help us uh, scale our business models, and uh, they are uh, they have no house of space industry. And uh, there are some exit prospects which we will see in the next five years, uh, mainly by larger companies. Uh, we, as, a, as a fact, we know that we are on uh, um, radars of few of the companies, but uh, we are not in high priority there. Uh, so we are looking at this uh, in the next five years, not yet. And we are doing our first pilot project in December, but we are also looking for further pilot projects of our uh, solar panel antennas in uh, um, in the next years to come. Um, we have uh, uh, this funding that we are asking would most majorly go for uh, payrolls, 50% uh, of that, and then 25% of that will be in R&D. Other uh, funding would be uh, lined up for facilities and uh, serving the uh, customer orders that would come to us. These are our contact details, uh, so please uh, follow up. Um, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to uh, reply back and uh, talk to you. Thank you very much. How do you think, because we've had this debate for two days, this is not specifically the topic you're addressing because you're purely in the technology part of it, but how do you think, yesterday we had a very interesting discussion about uh, it being much easier in the States to finance space exploration than in Europe. Can you think of, is it true from your perspective, <laughs> given where your company is based and where you operate mostly? I mean, is it, uh, can you think of, you know, building better PR, better storytelling for space exploration in Europe? I think it is a difficult uh, question sitting in Europe and uh, talking about this question. Uh, well, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, <my laughs> own. But uh, but I believe uh, it is it has some truth to it. I think uh, in US uh, there is um, more money flows, more easy money flows. You can find easy money, but then there is also more strict terms. I think uh, the conditions to work with startup in Europe is more humane than in Europe. Um, this is my impression, personal impression. So it's uh, it's not just money that uh, we should see. It's also uh, the pressure. Say it again, country. please, because you said it's uh, easy easier in Europe so, than yeah, in Europe. So maybe maybe I can rephrase in a better way. I will try. So. Um, the money uh, flow is uh, better in US, according to me, than in Europe. They're more risk taking. They invest in more risk, uh, more high risk projects. Mm -hmm. But then also there is a lot of uh, strict uh, regime, strict um, strictness that comes with that money, which is not. Now are we talking Europe. about VCs? Are we talking yes, about VCs. government? No, no, yes. VCs, VCs okay. particularly. And uh, other than that, I think the conditions to work in Europe is much more humane. I would like to work here, having money from US, uh, maybe. But um, uh, that's that's my impression, you know. I don't so know. Ideal scenario: get the money from the US, but still exactly. stay here and be based here. Exactly. And this is why I like startups. You know, for startups, there is no um, no country boundaries that I see personally. I think money can flow from anywhere. 
from any place from any continent last i mean last two weeks ago we were pitching for indian investors for example so money can flow anywhere i don't think uh, that is that should stop startups from uh, growth in a country and uh, they can expand but uh, working conditions and um, that that is also very important for me yeah how do you think we are not launching rockets essentially not, not much from europe are we but yeah. should we be launching rockets from europe should we establish the uh, i think so I think every country should be capable of doing whatever they want to do. They should well, not depend on Well, in theory, yes, that's a very idealistic scenario. Yes, but but, uh, but uh, you know, there there are uh, so I believe Europe collectively can work on different different technology parts. So as I I know many launch providers they are coming up in Germany, for example, where we are, and they are doing pretty good with that. And I think they would be open. So are, these are private companies, you know. So they would be open. They are not. So you believe it's all about specialization in exactly, individual exactly. areas rather than trying to uh, establish a Europe-wide project I that would so. be equivalent of SpaceX. I think so. I think every country can uh, in Europe focus on individual sides and excel this, and collectively they can be very super uh, power. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unity, you know. They should use that, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's this is my impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What. Uh, it looks like from your presentation that space is a passion for you. It's like yes, space is a passion. I but think. it's not an easy business at the same time, is it? Yeah, but uh, you could, with your skills, you could easily imagine yourself doing something more terrestrial rather than celestial, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. But I mean, um, when I was when I was uh, when I was in my job, um, I felt I cannot give my life to any other field, and then I had this urge to give up my life for space. I can, um, you know, it's it's a philosophical, but you can die in space peacefully. So uh, that is uh, that is something that brought me into this, and now uh, working on a startup as a as a tech guy, um, I have this unique um, urge to disrupt things, which uh, I think is very soothing once you're able to achieve it. And this is what I'm trying to do with these uh, antennas that I presented today. Once these are in market, I would um, see through it that uh, we are able to create some kind of uh, impression that people know on the world map where Celestial is located. You know, that is the aim that uh, I'm carrying with me right now. Since you're the, ver the first one to use the word celestial at this year's okay. <laughs> e ERC rather than, you know, space, just okay. space, celestial, as I said, sounds more poetic. What do you think from your perspective, looking at the whole space game, which is getting more and more intense, yeah. and, well, especially in America, but not only, given what China and Russia are doing yeah. right now. So what do you see as, as the top priorities and the top threats? Okay, priorities, and <laughs> I think this is a very heavy question for me. Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think uh, the the how I see it, I see this as um, as something that our world has converted into, not just in space, but uh, in different fields. I think the next uh, competitions or next wars that are going to happen in the world would be the wars of brains, not um, not power, not uh, not weapons, but wars of brains. And this is where well, we are only talking about hybrid warfare now. So yeah. I suppose this kind of war of brains is already happening. Troll yes, farms exactly. and all that, trying exactly. to influence people, fake news, presidential campaigns and all that. So exactly. it's already happening, isn't it? Exactly. Except exactly. it's not in the outer orbit yet. Exactly. And actually from there I would go, brain uh, wars of brain to information is going to be the weapon of this, uh, this uh, game. And this is where space comes into picture. You have so much information that you can gather from space that every, every country wants to lead on this. And this is where uh, different countries are competing with one another. Um, I My don't know which, which way this My will go. It's, yeah. it's a sunny day. It's Sunday. I really want you to close with something optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the future of space and tell us something optimistic. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I have, I have a theory and uh, which I often look uh, forward to when I'm in, in my um, depressing times. Uh, so one of one time, once uh, my professor told uh, that um, there was not supposed to be us. No, you know, this universe was supposed to be hydrogen and helium only. But uh, there was a miss and then stars were born and then supernovas happened and we were born. So ultimately, we everybody, even everything that we see around has stardust in it and we have stardust in it. And uh, then I I actually build up some of the other part of this theory. So why are we so unique? Why this chair doesn't move and why we move and other things? So I believe when uh, supernovas happen and these different molecules came together, um, they basically came in a, in a different proportion. So this were different for you and different for me. So we are unique. You are not like me, I'm not like you. And because we are so unique, we are occupying a volume in this in this entire universe or multiverse, if you want to call it, which cannot be occupied by any other object because you know nothing can uh, replace me or nothing can replace you, for example. And so, if you are sitting there uh, right now, occupying this volume, uh, you are basically saving a part of this universe which cannot be filled. And if you are 
vanished right now from this place there would be not not a thing in this world that can uh, fill up this void and everything will fall into this void uh, destroying the universe itself so if you are sitting right now i would call you you are saving the universe right now uh, at this point ladies and gentlemen let's consider it relatively optimistic and let's thank mayank with a round of thank applause you. thank you <laughs>